exactly. And um, you know, welcome everybody to our uh, our first hammer time of our, our second year and is kind of a, a typically the way we like to run things is to give a little bit of, of, of uh, what's going on in the center and then uh, give give uh, a featured speaker main course uh, into that. So I'm going to do a little bit of that right now and just talk a little bit about um, where we're at right now. And this will not take long and because we are already starting uh, just a little uh, a little bit. And, and Kathy, it seems like you're able to admit people as well, right? I, I'm it's not just- Yeah, yeah, I can keep going. Look, I can keep looking, go ahead. So um, with that, yeah, welcome to Hammer Time. This is uh, September 7, 2023. Um, September 1st, 2023 was the first day of our second year. So we've made it uh, made it through the first year um, so far. So far, NSF is happy with what we're doing, um, which is which is awesome, and uh, and, and th th that's only part of the picture. Uh, we will have uh, a lot more going on in year two. So lots going on in in, in year one. Uh, we've established our research programs thrusts. We have I think 10, 11 projects going on. Uh, we've developed a community. The community is getting together through meetings like this and, and live meetings. We have lots of education and outreach going on. Uh, we've developed some some really cool technical results. I, I, I like the things that you can put your hands on, uh, not just the uh, uh, numerical simulations, which are also important. But you know, we have a robotically controlled English wheel, and and that's won some uh, awards at. Uh, uh, with the student group there, we've got our Bendy bot. We've done some great work with Additive Plus X, showing how deformation can really improve the the properties of additively manufactured materials. Um, we're going to do some pivots in year two. Um, you know, number one, you can see that, that that our budgets go up significantly. We go from federal budget of three and a half million dollars to four and a half million dollars. Then we go up to six, and then uh, provided we make it all ten years, we'll temper tep, tep, taper down in years um, uh, eight, nine, and 10 of the whole thing. So we're gonna try more, uh, more quality in our meetings, less frequent meetings. Um, the hammer times, uh, we wanna make sure that they're really of general interest. Some of these really kind of getting to know you. Um, we wanna uh, make them a little bit more educational, be more educational offerings, more research, um, extend the inclusive community. So we're on a good, good start, wanna keep at it. Um, we've got uh, some great upcoming events. We've got a student boot camp here in Columbus, uh, October 12th, 13th, 14th. We particularly want Hammer students to come here, get to know each other, uh, learn technically about what we're doing, start building the community. Uh, we're having a GEM, GEM grad lab, primarily for uh, undergrads who are interested in learning about graduate school, October 28th. Uh, we'll have an external partners meeting um, coming up TBD in the October, November timeframe. Our scientific advisory board will meet in a similar time. I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, we will have our first very serious external review, probably late April, 2023, still waiting on dates from NSF, but that will have external reviewers and, and the like. And we have a very large annual, annual report that um, Kathy's been digging deeply into that will be due about five weeks before that. So. That, that's where we're at right now. Um, this is the, the scientific advisory board that we've, we've pulled together. Um, and we'll have a separate industry advisory board that's coming. But Bill Peter uh, from Oak Ridge, uh, who runs their, their MDF there, is the, the, the chair of that. John Hart, one of the leading intellects in manufacturing at MIT, was part of it. Lily Cheng, vice president for uh, artificial intelligence from Microsoft. Uh, Carolyn uh, uh, Seeperstead from uh, Georgia Tech, who does great work in design and additive there. Um, somebody else has it in, in review. Drew, Julie Christodoulou, who's been a, a thought leader uh, from ONR, is there. And then uh, 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 Professor Tamazuka from uh, Berkeley, who's a control theory leader, is, is the, the board. It's a great, great group coming together. Um, that'll help really, I think, cement the research agenda. The other thing we've been spending a lot of time on is developing uh, our industry in industry innovation system, industry facing innovation system. Um, we had a born on date of I think August 21st of Hamico Hybrid Autonomous Manufacturing Innovation Corporation, which is a 501c3. Um, IP will go there, and then Hamico will allow us to do things, make things, and keep the data within Hammer, which we're very excited about. 
And then we can also use that for startups and the like. So that's, that's going on. For all the faculty here, um, we will have something that looks like an IUCRC started that will, will leverage HEMICO. Um, the research tokens will basically be at $25,000 each. Uh, that allows uh, us, those, that money can be transferred at very low overhead into research programs. Um, basically, as, as, as faculty bring programs in uh, that are aligned with what they do with, with, with industry, we can, we can use that to start industry-related programs. Um, and if you get three tokens, that allows us to basically hire a graduate student. And um, with that, um, we, we, we can do lots of good work. And then also we can use this to make prototypes and do a lot of things that are very difficult uh, to do in a usual um, university environment, pass things through to, to companies and contracts and subcontracts, lots of great flexibility, very innovative that's coming on. Um, also, we have uh, at Hammer uh, inspired, I think, the a TMS specialty conference that will happen um, in October uh, uh, or uh, uh, June. Uh, uh, October is when abstracts are due this year, June 16 to 20. There's a, a digital and robotic forming symposium um, that that will that will take place, and uh, Hammer should flood the zone here. Um, I'm the lead organizer for this. Uh, Jane Chow. Kester, Kester Clark, um, Babak Rastnia, who's a, who's a Hammer member, is part of it. Um, and it should be a great, great, uh, great symposium coming up then. So um, those are the things that are coming. Um, we can talk a little bit about that at the end. And before we, um, you know, before we have discussion, what I'd like to do is, is turn things next over to our featured speak, speaker, Dave Fuhrer from uh, Pratt & Whitney. And um, uh, I've uh, had a lot of great conversations with Dave over the past several months uh, at various times and places. And it turns out yeah, he's been trying to do a lot of the things we've been talking about with Hammer and uh, his, his, he sees the vision, um, sees the difficulties, try, has tried and done a lot of things. And um, we're eager to hear what he has to say. He's got a great background in this. He uh, comes from forging industry, spent some time at Lattice Forge that is a uh, PhD at the uh, University of Ulm in, in Germany. Germans have a great tradition in these sort of things. He's a past president of ASM, and currently he's a uh, member of the National Academy of Engineers, um, and he is uh, uh, really leading Pratt & Whitney's uh, re manufacturing quality modeling efforts around structural turbine materials. and. Uh, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna end uh, my uh, uh, and stop sharing here and turn things over to you, Dave, and uh, have great interest in uh, all you have to say. All right, very good. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, let me see if I'm sharing this. Am I sharing it correctly? Perfect. Perfect. Good. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm gonna present a few items here this afternoon. Um, uh, first couple comments are on things that are near and dear to me. And so I'm going to share them with you. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to go through some uh, forging kind of 101 that might be hopefully not too boring, but I, I think it's important for the, the group here to think about. And what are the pros and cons of uh, different forging processes and, and what you're doing uh, and how is it really uh, um, uh, impactful, no pun intended, to uh, uh, the, the deformation manufacturing world? If there's any questions at any point, please do just, just uh, um, shout out. Uh, again, I want to talk a little bit about material definitions and the issue of materials and, and products as we make them. Uh, what is... Uh, what, what is the, the uh, thing we're trying to make? Um, incremental forging processes, a little bit of a background on that, and some examples of incremental and, and hybrid forging. So this is the area that is very, very near and dear to me, is the issue of how do we define parts? And uh, I think many, many people believe that when you make a part, uh, it's made from a specification, a single material, so you're going to define that, and you can uh, um, um, then look at it 
and assess it, and it should be homogeneous, perfectly homogeneous, because you have a, a specification that tells you what the properties are, there's a min value, therefore you can do a structural analysis by looking at that part, and the cross-section will have that single value. But we know that's not true. And so um, the reality is there's a, a gradient of microstructure and properties in, in nearly everything that we produce. And when we have a uh, material definition, and part of that material definition is um, design curves, the design curves have to capture variability, variability in the material, be it the chemistry, variability in the microstructure, and, and, and those things uh, spatially throughout a part. So you can go like on the, on the figure on the right, and you start seeing all this scatter, and you say, well, it's really just scatter. And you say, okay, statistically, let's just sort of analyze it and then figure out what the minus two or minus three sigma is. And here, there's your minimum curve. And that's what you're going to describe that material to be. And so the, the world has lived well with that approach. I think it's, it's not the right way to go, uh, per se. I think there's other ways to go that are uh, we can actually take more value out of the material and manufacturing process by doing location-specific designing. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a reference down here in the bottom that uh, goes through some of the, the uh, background on, on material definitions and such as well. But again, getting into a, a component, and if you look at it, if it's a forged part, could actually be manufactured by other processes as well. Um, the color image is a cross section, say, of a forging, and there's a center line over here to the left of it. And, and that forging, there's a phantom line inside, but it has contours of mechanical properties for, for reason. It's not by random, it's for reason. It's, it's uh, path dependency. So it's an important issue is path dependency of manufacturing processes results in the mechanical properties that we will finally observe for that material within that volume. But Again, the traditional way of doing things would be just take the material from this configuration, maybe other configurations, and we start doing testing and we test the materials and we believe they all should be one value because it's one specification. But we see this scatter. Then again, we start saying that the scatter uh, we can contend with by taking a minus two sigma or minus three sigma. And here's the minimum property for that, that material. But if you start looking at it zonally, the zones are actually really well understood and really well controlled. And they come as a result of the manufacturing process path. And those zones can be quite, quite tightly controlled. And their minus two or three sigma can be much, much better. So even here in this case, the worst case location within this part, it's minus two or minus three sigma minimum property is well above the property uh, that you would assume if you had all of the, the values added together. It, so it's, it's a really kind of a strange thing. Uh, uh, that's how we, we live in this world uh, uh, of, of materials and manufacturing. And, and the reason why I'm raising it here to this group is if you're gonna go off and start doing incremental deformation and uh, location specific processing, I think that you should cherish it and you should start looking at it and saying, hey, I don't need to be the same property everywhere. Let's actually understand those properties locally and make sure we put that as part of the product definition and then use that understanding to do qualification uh, and certification. Um, this whole issue of location specific microstructures and then subsequently location specific properties. There's also a recent paper in uh, uh, IMR uh, that you can look up. It's all about uh, serves, so statistically equivalent representative volume elements, and a way to describe uh, a, a microstructure or a, a zone of microstructure for um, property reasons. This all comes together when we today are designing parts and that part might be a, a turbine disc or some other configuration, an airfoil, a case, et cetera, a shaft. 
And in the design community, they can actually do this and they do iterations on, on designs for configuration and they'll have a parametric model. And the parametric model will make sure it fits the application requirement, et cetera. But again, in, in the traditional way, they would paint this one color of property. What we really, really want to be doing, and we are actually doing it here, so I'm actually very encouraged and, and uh, very happy that we've built up a really, really strong team and infrastructure here at, at Pratt Whitney. But we're actually looking at the issue of, of having model-based material definitions that link with model-based manufacturing process definitions that can give us information about microstructure and properties on a location basis. That culminates into a parametric analysis and gives us a more complete component-based, model-based definition. So there's a number of reasons why we wanna do this and, and uh, it's, it's extremely, extremely helpful. Um, now jumping into let's say forging uh, 101, uh, I've done a lot of forging in, in my life and uh, I think it's a, a great manufacturing process. Again, open die forging, if you're doing upsetting, again, taking a workpiece, putting it on dies, forging it in some uh, form or fashion, issues of friction, issues of temperature, issues of flow stress, things we have to worry about. Incremental forging, you know, using cogging and dies that uh, can be used to do local working, uh, very, very common to make shafts or to make preforms where you need to have a certain amount of volume or material in one location versus another. Again, you're, you're trying to make shapes incrementally. Again, very, very common. Um, using a swaging kind of tool or process where you have multiple hammers and these hammers are coming in um, incrementally as you feed material into this, this uh, uh, work area. And you can start to make very, very complex uh, configurations uh, of these kind of, of shapes, tapers or shafts um, for say uh, uh, gas turbine engines. So again, it's not using a full closed die. It's actually using incremental deformation to do the straining where you need it. But that straining where you're, you're needing it does mean that you're actually doing metallurgical work in those areas and you need to be taking that into account um, and understanding that from a microstructure and, and processing path and, and property uh, perspective. Another one as well, and it's probably less known to, to people is the issue of, uh, it's, it's kind of an old process, saddle forging, where you can take and make very, very large rings and where you, uh, it is very, very difficult to have a, a ring rolling mill, very expensive pieces of equipment to ring roll very, very large, large seamless rings. You can actually make uh, a, a upset, punch a hole into it to make a little donut, put that donut onto a mandrel and then use a press and incrementally reduce the wall you incrementally increase, increase the uh, circumference or diameter of the ring, and you can make the, the part that you need. You can do this in, in, uh, with different uh, cross sections of, the, of the, the uh, die on top or the mandrel, and also put profiles in it as you need as well. But again, it, it, it um, allows you to have an imagination of things you could do uh, if you're not going to go and make a, a dedicated piece of equipment, a large multi-million dollar uh, rolling mill, you could actually computerize a system by which you're using a universal setup and universally you can actually make one-offs of, of unique uh, configurations. The issue of forging has always been a, a, a bit of a problem where you're trying to make shapes and the shapes are not uniform in cross section. And so you can be starting off with uh, bar stock, which is uniform in a cross section. And then you need to start to uh, uh, gather material, you know, thicken it up in cross section, reduce it in other cross sectional areas, put it into to closed dies and start to make shapes and then finally finish and trim the parts. The tools that are used to do this sometimes are actually closed dies, uh, such as a blocker or a preforming tool. 
but they can be also done in a open die configuration as well, where you can actually have a fullering die where you're pushing material out or a die for gathering and uh, bringing material in to, to a given area. So again, this is the, an issue of, of um, the manufacturing processes that can be used um, and, and they can be automated, right, to, to do these things. You can program them. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of uh, moving away from manual things. And also, in this case, for this, this group and this team, away from um, uh, capital intensive single sets of tools and single sets of, of manufacturing equipment that can only make one thing. There's, there's many, many cases of that. And I'll show you some examples here in a minute. Uh, we shouldn't forget the past, shouldn't forget what we, we can do well today. But that's one of the challenges that the industry has as a whole for manufacturing is how do we become flexible and not uh, uh, reliant just on these very, very capital uh, intensive uh, approaches. So uh, forging press methods, um, again, you have uh, fluid uh, in a cylinder to, to, to uh, force a ram down or up uh, fundamentally. So hydraulic pressure for the deformation energy. Some of the issues with it, it's slow in its strain rate, um, long constant loading, uh, large amounts of heat transfer or chilling. So that's something that's important for everyone to, to consider too. Because the deformation processes that you're looking at to make parts, uh, if you're doing them in a heated uh, manner, you have to worry about um, uh, the temperature distribution. If you're chilling uh, the part in certain areas, but not in others. And in some cases, uh, and I'll talk about in a moment, if you have very high strain rates, you can have adiabatic heating and you have to, you have to worry about those kind of conditions as well. In, in hydraulic uh, press uh, forging processes, you can have hot dyes where the dyes are, are heated above uh, normal ambient temperatures or, or low type working temperatures or isothermal where the dyes are heated up to the exact same temperature as the workpiece. And, and that actually is uh, um, an example here. I don't know if this is gonna come through or not. We'll see. A little video maybe. This happens to be at um, ATI Forge, Laddish Forge. It was Laddish before it was ATI Forge or uh, ATI Metals. This is uh, one of the first uh, isothermal forging presses. And again, those are, it's a piece of material, uh, nickel-based super alloy. It's been coated, it's white, and it's been coated with boron nitride. It's now been transferred in after being heated up to around uh, 1950 degrees F range. The tools are at the same temperature. They're, they're thermocoupled, as you can see. Work pieces can be uh, equilibrated in temperature and under very, very slow controlled um, uh, strain rates, you can super plastically form a, uh, a turbine disc. And this is an example of that kind of a process using you know, press forging. Again, very elegant, uh, very expensive capital equipment, and also for the entire press itself, but also for the tooling that, that is needed for this uh, dedicated process. Um, hammer forging. Um, again, is, is a very, very interesting process. Um, it can be uh, done at a very small scale where you could actually have, and I think that the team here is looking at uh, uh, very localized, uh, almost like peening uh, hammers and anvils to form and shape sheet metal. Uh, or you can use a hammer high strain rate uh, process to do bulk forming as well. The schematic on the right uh, shows a single acting hammer. And in this case, it was uh, an old board hammer uh, approach. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. I've never seen one of those in my life. I've seen uh, um, pictures and videos, but a board hammer would actually have a set of uh, rollers 
that would clamp in, grab the board uh, or planks, raise the entire uh, steel ram die assembly, and then release, and it would drop and actually uh, uh, strike and impact the workpiece. Very, very unusual kind of process, if you ask me. The more modern uh, hammer methods are, are pneumatic. So you have a, uh, a piston, and it's connected to the ram, and connected to the, the die, and you then forge it, uh, forge the parts at um, multiple incremental blows. So your energy comes from 1F mv uh, squared, right? So you have this uh, mass and velocity impact, and you go incremental uh, for deformation. So single acting, there can be counter blow uh, pneumatic hammers where the bottom uh, die and a top die move in a, a counter direction to each other uh, to give greater um, velocity, uh, greater uh, um, kinetic energy for impact and, and uh, transfer into the workpiece. Um, computer controlled hammers. Uh, this is something I had worked on uh, a couple of decades ago, um, computerizing these. So they actually run a, a pre-programmed uh, process. And I'll show you some information about that and, and what had been possible and, and well beyond that today. Um, again, kinetic energy is used for the deformation process, uh, very high strain rate and incremental strains per each of the steps. Um, this happens to be the world's largest uh, forging hammer, uh, 1 million foot-pounds of energy on impact, 1 million foot-pounds. It's, it's absolutely uh, fascinating uh, piece of equipment. Uh, again, this is a massive capital investment to do something that you're going to work on to make a uh, single part in a closed die. So that's a challenge. So if you can do it incrementally, instead of doing it all at once in a closed die, that may be a very, very advantageous thing to do. Um, but if you haven't seen such a, a, a hammer working, it's, it's pretty amazing. I'll show you a video here in a second. Uh, but they're used for making very large turbine discs out of super alloy that are very, very difficult to deform, landing gear, uh, flap tracks, and other very, very large uh, structural parts. So hopefully this, this video here will work. So each one of those blows that are being imparted onto that workpiece is 1 million foot pounds. Uh, even though that looked like it was doing very, very small incremental deformation, in that case, for that super alloy part, it was a process called isocon, where it was isothermally forged to give a, a very, very uh, specific configuration, very controlled grain structure. And in this process, this was actually a warm working process where a controlled amount of strain in a warm working uh, area was imparted to actually add uh, strength and, and uh, stress rupture capabilities for that entire uh, disc uh, component. Mechanical presses, again, something that uh, the team may be looking at or working on. This is actually a, a traditional, very large kind of mechanical press where you have a flywheel and that flywheel is moving around and there's a, an eccentric shaft and you can engage it. And, that, and when you engage it, it, it then moves a ram uh, and platen up and down and it can then do uh, work onto uh, uh, material that you have uh, in, in the die locations. So... Uh, a little bit of an example here of what that would look like. And if you can imagine it, you saw that piece of, it's a piece of steel. And that steel is being deformed at enormous strain rates and, and also very, very large strains. So they descale, upset, one squeeze, preform it, finish forge, and it'll trim the part completely done. It's a uh, near net part 
uh, for this application and all done in uh, four, four steps. So one of the things that think about for forging processes in conventional and hot dye uh, forging uh, approaches, the temperatures uh, again are in different ranges. They may even be a little bit lower than that. They can be room temperature up to a, a, a couple thousand degrees. Uh, strains 0.2 to three uh, true strain. Uh, strain rates can be um, um, low uh, in in uh, hydraulic presses. Uh, isothermal forging again can be done at very high temperatures. Strains very high. Strain rates typically very very low. And again, for the, the purposes of superplastic forming, mechanical presses, like we just saw, again, different temperature ranges, very high strain. Uh, intermediate strain rates, now pretty high, up to as high as, say, five per second. It's a pretty high strain rate. And hammer forging now, going to a higher uh, strain rate yet of like 15 to 150 uh, per second. So very high strain rates. We start doing those kind of strain rates at uh, mechanical press strain rates or hammer strain rates, you have to start worrying about adiabatic heating um, and uh, uh, things that can occur uh, because of the adiabatic heating. And I'll show you some of that in a minute uh, through some modeling activities. An important uh, issue to think about is uh, what are the questions you have to ask about your process? So some independent uh, variables, what kind of starting material are you gonna use? Uh, what's your starting geometry of your material? Are you going to have tools or not tools? Um, are they universal or are they going to be completely closed tools? Uh, are you going to use lubrication or, or no lubrication? Is lubrication bad or do you need to have a friction? Um, starting temperatures, speed of the deformation, amount of deformation. These can actually be analyzed and understood and you can try to answer those questions either with experience. So talk to somebody who's done it for a long, long time. Uh, that might be an okay way of going. I, I wouldn't prefer it. You can run experiments, and that's okay too, but that's actually expensive, right? And you're going to have to do that by running an experiment. Hopefully, it's an a, a informed experiment. Learn from it, and then go off and do some more uh, trials or, or modeling. And, of course, uh, modeling to guide decision-making then go off and, and do a trial. And hopefully that trial is right the first time. And the thing you're trying to answer is, what are the, the forces that you need? What are the power requirements? Whether it's a full contact deformation or incremental uh, localized deformation, uh, what are the properties you're trying to, to produce? Uh, what kind of temperatures do you want to uh, produce during that uh, deformation process? Surface finish and surface finish control, dimensional precision, and, and the flow, metal flow details, uh, is there an issue relative to uh, grain structure, possible texture formation, et cetera? So some of the material characterizations that need to be done, things you need to look at the characteristics, uh, flow stress, and flow stress as a function of temperature, strain, strain rate, uh, formability, the ductility of the material, strain hardening or strain softening behavior, recrystallization kinetics, and, and reaction uh, char characteristics as well uh, to the process. If you're doing it at, at low temperatures, does it have uh, spring back? Uh, are you generating uh, residual stress uh, due to non-uniform strain, et cetera? So process modeling is, is an area that uh, I've been working on for nearly all my career. Uh, and, and the issue of trying to use that kind of an approach to understand uh, thermal conditions of any manufacturing process and then deformation models to look at uh, the strain and the, the strain path for, for a component. Because again, going back to the very, very first slide, uh, a, a material uh, is processed to make a part, and the part will have properties locally based on its local manufacturing process path. So we need to understand this, this path dependency very, very well. So modeling can be done to, to look at uh, strain or, or damage accumulation within a part. Um, so you can see that here. Um, on, the, on the right, there are some comparisons between hot dye and mechanical press. So again, hot dye, the tools are heated to a, a intermediate temperature, not isothermal, but pretty hot. 
uh, relative to the workpiece temperature, slow strain rate, mechanical press, the, the die temperatures are low, <clears throat> but the, the strain rate is, is relatively high. And that strain per operation is very high. So if you look at this and you start looking at the strain and the strain contours, there are areas here that we have very low strain. There's some low strain up here, but very, very high strain in, in one location around this radius. Temperatures is more telling. So we actually have on the mechanical press where it's not heated tools, very, very a large amount of chilling that can occur. But to accommodate that area and the low strain, we have to ha have to have another region that is strained pretty heavily and it has uh, not much time to dissipate heat. So it ends up having adiabatic heat and you can get to a, a pretty reasonably high temperature. Here's a, a really interesting example of a part that was produced uh, with a, a mechanical press. And, and the input material, this is actually a 718 material. So 718 material, it was heated up to a temperature and nominally had ASTM 8 grain size, ASTM 8, um, um, 50 microns, something like that maybe. I, I forget the number exactly, something on that order. So so it's, it's relatively coarse um, grain size. And as that material has been deformed, it starts to strain and recrystallize and it will recrystallize dynamically and start producing grain sizes of ASTM 12 and 13, which are something on the order of like um, eight microns or so. And it turns out that there's another region that, that also forms and it is actually shown here like this teardrop shape. And it actually is producing a region of around ASTM 10 grain size, which is about 10 microns. And, and that actually is due to adiabatic heating. So we ac actually have had enough strain in this part. We've, we've dynamically recrystallized the majority of the part. We've dynamically recrystallized this region here as well, but we had enough adiabatic heating to cause grain growth. We've been able to actually predict it. So this is actually a predicted contour and it matches uh, uh, almost uh, spot on with measurements as well. The issue of, of going and, and um, uh, engaging and, and uh, looking at uh, Industry 4.0, and this is actually a long time ago. This is actually from a paper uh, on uh, computer controlled hammers back in 1999. So it's, it's I guess, a few years old. Um, but was actually taking a hammer, and there's the ram, and going up to the head where there's a pneumatic system. And, and actually develop a, a computer control system that can actually monitor, run, and run the RAM at any speed and at any rate. So this could be done if you actually had a, a manipulator, which you could do to feed in, and you can start to actually uh, forge shafts or other things. But one of the main reasons is to actually control uh, temperature, right? So now you can go and start to forge and incrementally control uh, the amount of, of adiabatic heating and then uh, the amount of heat that you're allowing to release through the, the tooling and structure. This is a, a way to um, now link it to models to come up with a hammer forged product with a very, very controlled microstructure and, and final mechanical properties throughout the volume. In addition to controlling the hammer, uh, sensors being put all over the hammer itself. And again, uh, um, this is an example. Uh, the, the pressure in the head of the uh, hammer, it will rise. You'll, you'll um, actuate it. So it wants to uh, uh, accelerate downward. The, the pressure in the head re uh, reduces but it strikes the workpiece and then there's a reflected uh, pressure wave back up into the sensor in the head. And as you go with incremental steps, you can now start to read that the um, part is starting to fill the tool and you can actually start to see the metal flow within the tools and, and link this to, to models as well. 
So looking at modeling and modeling activities, again, uh, an old paper from a TMS conference uh, where you can start to forge uh, parts uh, in a hammer and control very, very closely the, the temperature uh, strain and, and microstructure within the, within the part. Again, this is not uh, incrementally making a part such as uh, incre incrementally making a shaft per se, but it's incremental deformation to get a final part. This is actually an example of true incremental deformation. So if you wanna do uh, extrusion and you wanna extrude a, a hollow tube, you can do that. There are ways of having an extrusion uh, press and extrude through a, a floating mandrel and you can actually make tubes uh, seamless, uh, pseudo seamless. Uh, by extrusion processes. This is actually an incremental extrusion process. So if you have a mandrel, a workpiece, and a roller, you can start to then press the roller into that tool, pull it as well, and the angle on which you have that tool and the pressure will actually cause deformation locally underneath that tool, and it will incrementally extrude. Uh, you can do it with a mandrel or you can do it with opposing rollers. Uh, here's a paper uh, that is in a ASM Metals Handbook uh, article. This process with the double rollers, uh, for anyone who's ever seen the old, old historic now uh, space shuttle, the space shuttle that flew all of the external solid rocket boasters uh, that flew, they were all made by this process. And all of the wall sections on the space shuttle solid rocket motor cases were made net. There was no machining on those parts at all. It was all done net. Only thing that was machined were the flanges to assemble those rocket cases. Other ways of doing things too is be by spinning. And a spinning process is, is similar. Uh, instead of uh, doing a extrusion process per se, you can actually do a forming process. So you're forming it over a mandrel and making shapes. Um, also referenced in this ASM handbook as well. Uh, another um, approach is to do radial roll forming, which is actually kind of a, an unusual and novel thing to do. So if you had a preform, which is a block of material, and you wanted to make some sort of arbitrary disc, you could come in with a set of rollers, push them axially onto that uh, rotating uh, uh, disc, and then start to pull it radially outward. And you can start to form and produce very, very unusual and exotic shapes. And then also spin uh, drive arms and shafts and flanges onto those parts, making effectively net parts and very, very, very little metal loss. Another activity that uh, uh, has been done in the past, and this is way, way, way back when, also in 2004, um, there's actually a process today that I, I hear has been patented called Ampliforge. It's kind of bizarre. Uh, this was a process that I had worked on with a engineer at Boeing, uh, Rod Boyer. It's, it's actually trying to look at this, this incremental deformation process, right? So you have to do make a very complicated part you want to go and make these uh, uh, preforms that have the right material in the right location. This is an example of an MD-11 airframe part. And it's again, old, old part. Um, and actually it, it maybe it resonates even more today because if you have an old, old part out in the field, do you really wanna go out and make and retool for, for old retired uh, uh, tooling that may have been uh, no longer kept in existence? So how are you gonna make the part? This part actually started out with a billet, had to be forged in this kind of a manner, it looks like a shaft, but to gather material, preform it uh, near final forge and then final forge to get the final shape. It went through, actually, this doesn't show all the steps. It, it went through about um, seven different forging dies to get the final part. That's a bit of a challenge. So the goal we were going to do was to use additive manufacturing plus forging to make it down to one, one process, right? One step, one step forging. So this is way back when, again, um, and it's, it's published in this paper, Rod Boyer and, and myself. So it was uh, Airmet um, company 
uh, produced um, uh, directed energy deposition titanium uh, preforms. We were able to study these preforms and look at deformation processes of what kind of strains and temperature conditions will we need to convert the microstructures from those deposition structures into a wrought product that would be equivalent to or uh, certifiable to a, a forged product. So we did that and we designed a preform. So going right from a plate, building up a preform. So now we have a hybrid part that, that has a base material, additively manufactured uh, component configuration. And then we one step forged it. So this is the part, this is actually cut ups of the part. Here's the cross section of the part. You can't even really tell that there's a difference in the material from the, the base plate and the uh, additive uh, uh, rib structure. That was a, a very, very, very good success and a good example. Um, the, the economics at the time were still uh, being looked at and worked on, but it was actually a little bit before its time, uh, before additive became very, very popular. And now there's you know, literally millions of companies doing these kind of things. But this was uh, a process to do a combination of additive plus forge. So conclusion, deformation processes are very flexible. Incremental forging is actually common. A location-specific engineering is super, super, super important, and it needs to be considered in manufacturing processes and, and should be taken advantage of. Hybrid preforms and deformation processes enable further manufacturing flexibility. So this hybrid process, like using uh, additive and forging, uh, may be a, a great way to go. So with that, um that's all i have any questions first thank you so much that, that was awesome i mean th th these are uh things that we, we've been thinking about and um you know the, the the combination of simplicity and insight in the talk i think was 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 super you know just uh really really enjoyed that tremendous yeah, ma master the obvious on some of the uh, forging things I but, tell you, the, the obvious isn't obvious to a lot of us i mean that they, you, you look around the world you see that all the time um <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, I think my favorite uh, was, the, I think, the saddle forging, too, which is a, a process. I don't think I've, if I've seen it, it hasn't stuck with me before, but that I see a lot of the things that can be solved with variants of that. Um, you know, one thing that that I don't understand as an academic, I wonder kind of from, from your point of view, there's two two things I'm kind of wondering how, how the, the industry world thinks about it. It's probably more than that, but I'll just mention two for now. Um, and num number one is just kind of is are there databases or easy ways of knowing who's got certain facilities? You know, is, is that is it, that, that you know if somebody if I wanted to find somebody to do saddle forging, how does a, a standard you know how does a typical design engineer find that? And then secondly, once you do, what is the 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 high level of, of working this through FAA or whoever has to, 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 to do that, to, to tell, Hey, you know, I'm using local properties here, not the usual, um, you know, uh, mill handbook or, uh, whatever the, the, the handbook is called, uh, uh, yeah. MMPDS or whatever. MMPDS, you know, yeah. kind of values for, uh, for that. How, how does, how does that, you know, you have two questions there. So yep, one, yep. one question about where to go and, and how do we know what, what's available in the world? Um, and, and, and I, that's actually all about, uh, I think, uh, in the industrial world, knowing various suppliers, that's one way of doing it, uh, and, and reaching out to groups, but there's, there's different associations. So forging industry association, FIA, uh, is probably the largest forging group. So FIA has a list of all forgers in the world. And for the members that are members of FIA, they provide what their capabilities are equipment wise, right. their experience in materials and processing, et cetera. So you can get information very, very readily from that kind of a group. Um, the issue of, of how do you qualify various things? Um, it, 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 in a way, so I'll, I'll just use the example, additive manufacturer. How, how do you qualify that? All right, so it's, it's a new process, you know, it's a new product. How do you qualify that? You have to get down to the point where, firstly, a company themselves have to understand what is it that they're trying to design and make, right? What are they What are they trying to design and make? 
if you can des describe it, what it is you're trying to design and make, and you can have a means of uh, defining what are the spatially related uh, distributed properties, you then develop a test program and protocol to ensure that you're actually meeting those, those requirements. Um, uh, to a large extent, um, groups like the FAA or EASA um, are, 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 are very happy, right? That, that uh, a design community knows what the hell they're doing, right? On, uh, on, a, on a material and on a product. So uh, it, it actually, it, it's quite a, uh, a large question, but to a large extent, um, all OEMs in the aerospace world have to meet their own capabilities and requirements first before you would ever bring it into a, a, a regulatory uh, uh, group. Um, the regulatory groups are, are right now very, very dodgy on, on additive. And I think rightly so, because I think personally, there's many, many groups that are making parts and saying that they have a part, looks like a part, smells like a part, must be a part, but they really don't know what the heck's inside it. And yep. if you said, I've qualified that part because I made a test coupon, well, you're not flying the test coupon, you're flying the part. Right. So if you don't have a robust way of understanding truly what's in that part and, and being able to qualify that you can make that part every time, then, then you're going to have a hard day. And that's what's actually been a challenge for, say, the world of additive. But I think this world of hammer and looking at incremental deformation and looking at location-specific designing, you can actually start to design and build in what you think are, are the requirements locally. And, and if you can do that and use those um, uh, requirements locally to guide your qualification and certification testing, then, then you'll go a long way. Sorry for that long answer. Oh, it's a good, good answer. It's a, a, There's a couple, a couple of hands were up too. Sorry. Oh, yeah, Jane, Jane, and then, and then way, I don't, way may have had to leave, had to leave. I don't see her hand or her there anymore, but uh, go ahead, Jane. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Dave, for a great, 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 inspiring talk. So particularly, I'm interested in the last example that you showed, which, you know, it, it, usually when we say, you know, research doesn't doesn't start just uh, like two years ago, three years ago, you can Google it. So this one is really nice because it showed the example back to like 20 years ago, almost, right? You did it. Um, so I was curious why you did this when you have the microstructure from the DED and then you forge it and get to the point that you say you don't know, want to have the microstructure of the forge part. How was that design process go? You know, did you do the simulations or based on your knowledge, you try it or, you know, now, yeah, how so, long did it take? Yeah, yeah so, so um, first thing first was, what was the, what was the required amount of deformation to achieve a microstructure that would be deemed useful, okay. right? So we did a lot of um, those uh, very small upset tests, right? Okay. So we, we did some straining, looked at strain, strain rate, temperature, um, uh, um, path assessments. Okay. We actually put that into a model framework so actually we used it to calibrate a model for recrystallization. Then we actually went and designed what would the preform need to be to actually provide the strain level needed in all the locations on, on the additive area to allow us to actually exceed that strain value. Mm -hmm. So that's how we actually backed into the, the, the design for the preform. So we could mm -hmm. actually have a one tool process, one mm -hmm. forging, get the strain level needed in all of that added additive manufactured regions and then have the final part. Nice. Was it, was temperature considered as a factor? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely was. So temperature absolutely was. Great. Thanks. John? Yeah, this How is great, you to do this? <laughs> that was the second piece of the question. Sorry, John, you know. Yeah, no, this is fantastic. I, yeah. I, uh, I, I kind of a follow up question. So could you could could you imagine, Dave, or maybe even that's what you did? You have a part that you kind of topology optimized, but it didn't have the local properties that you need somewhere. 
and then you just deform it in that local region because that's where you really needed it. You got the topology, but you didn't have the properties locally. That in a way, that's what we did. You're right because uh, we we actually were constrained by the final part configuration. It, it had to be a final part. So what we our goal was. Um, how do you go from like the seven closed die tools yeah. to one? We wanted one closed die tool. So that one closed die tool then told us to say, hey, what is the level of strain that we need to have? Yeah. And how much material can we use as additive material? Right. So we want to maximize the additive material mm -hmm. and go with one forging process. And we had to actually hit the criteria of strain level, however so that you could actually make the right microstructure. So, so those are the things that we had to uh, uh, control. Very fun. Hey, Dave, if I may just quickly follow up the second part of the question. How, sure. long did, how long did it take you to go from the concept to the final, um, you know, final, final realization? Well, it was actually um, a, a a research project. It was on a, a relatively old part. And again, it may actually be a, a, a relevant um, approach today when we have legacy aircraft, legacy okay. parts, even in the, uh, say, the construction world, say. So so general industrial stuff where, where tooling is not readily available and you need to come up with a way to make something fast and, and cost effective. So do you want to go and make seven seven dies? The answer would be no. Yeah. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do anything. You want to make one die at, at the at the worst, right? Uh -huh. And and so uh, it was a demonstration development program, and it probably took us again not a a production process uh, based program. In a production world, it should probably take no more than uh, uh, um, of you know really literally a couple months to actually design everything, have everything ready, and be able to go. It probably took us a year and a half, maybe uh, mm -hmm. two years tops that that we did from start to finish. Um, and again, this is back in the day when there was only really one uh, major uh, additive manufacturing group, uh, um, Airmet. And Airmet's not around anymore. They they were a division of uh, MTS, if everyone remembers them, yep. up in uh, 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 Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So I've got kind of a general question too. The, you know, there have been these uh, process diagram maps where you know, plot strain rate and temperature, and you you know, and say this is about where I might want to be. How much difference is there in the final microstructure you might get if you were to take a part and say upset it? And I don't know the S. This might be published, but but you, we're going to give it a, a given amount of strain, and you do that in a hydraulic press, and you might do that at a strain rate of you know ten percent per minute or per second or you do that in five hammer blows yeah and you get to it, the it, you know, it turns out that you get much much more uniformity in hammer forging is that uh, right? yeah it's because of contact time you, contact you're, time and, and you break the friction each time you're, you're not you don't you're, have you're, the same you're, friction you're, hill yeah the, the friction is, is an important point but also temperature loss you can actually sit on a die uh like on a hammer die you can sit there it's temperature loss is very low it's actually the pressure that you push and you get uh, intimate contact, your, your interfacial contact uh, and, and heat transfer coefficient is very, very high under pressure. Yep. And so uh, hydraulic uh, press forging or mechanical uh, press forging, even though mechanical presses are a fraction of a second, they're much, much higher heat loss and your microstructural variation is much higher. If you go and do uh, hammer forging, you have the ability to control the temperature uh, uh, much, much more uniformly, actually. But that's also the reason why uh, the computer controlled hammer approaches were being done, too, because early on, uh, hammers uh, were designed like a board hammer. As you can imagine a board yeah. hammer that's like yeah. uh, 80 billion years ago, almost sounds like a uh, um a water mill process, right? Sounds like something crazy. <laughs> but but a board hammer, it, it, you can understand that it has one energy. You raise up to it to a height, right. you let go of it, it has one energy. And so these pneumatic hammers- You uh, raise it half as high, I guess, but yeah, but you're, you're, you're but, back but, but actually, But actually, they, they never were designed to do that. 
Okay. So, so they they would have one energy setting, and and most uh, pneumatic hammers were the same way. Uh, they would go and have one setting. So they would go up to their like a top dead center and then come back down and uh, uh, give a, a a strike. But now with a computer controlled hammer, you can go and have any level of impact energy you want. And that's one of the big reasons for doing it is uh, you don't have much contact time, right? So you're not getting a lot of chilling, but you don't want to actually impart huge amounts of energy early so that you start getting adiabatic heat. You want to actually hit it at, at lo relatively low energies and then increase your energy uh, uh, input. Once well, you start filling the die and so forth, once we have, once your contact area is larger and all of that. Yeah, that's correct. Cool. You, your energy needs to be increased. Oh, very cool. Any other questions? We're a little bit over time, but yeah, thank you. Iman. I see I'm right in the middle of the screen here. here and, How's yeah. Iman? Yeah. Great seeing you, Dave. Great seeing you. Nice, nice seeing you as well. Well, th thanks again so much, Dave. We'll, 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 uh, we'll set up some time. I want to talk separately about the, the, this has been great. This is awesome. So, yeah, because one of the things I thought was important, and some of the slides are probably like master of the obvious, you can you can pull out anything about uh, these these processes and look it up. But I think it's important to step back and really look at them and understand them and, and what their uh, reasons for being. Why, why were they done? And, 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 and what are the things that a incremental process can afford uh, over those traditional processes? And, and to a large extent, as you saw some of those those uh, pieces of equipment, those are multi-million dollar pieces of equipment. Oh, yeah. The tools are also huge, huge cost and in investments as well. It's and so time too slow. Uh, yeah, to, to design it, to make a piece of equipment, to make tools. And so incremental processing that has the ability to be flexible and can actually make parts on shape uh, would be great where we're going that's a that's our north star yeah we we'll, 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 yeah, we're eager to really uh appreciate that uh yeah the the the, the details and 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 I, I tell you the obvious is, is is one thing but in you know we, we we teach engineering we don't do the obvious we do a lot of the details and, and it's sometimes the obvious you know eludes us sometimes so um i think it's really important to 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 do this systematic process design as, as you've kind of thought through what what you know what 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 what's your goal and what's the best way to get there and and you know do the do the big picture first and, the, the so and as, as, as the whole team knows too um you, you don't go into any of these processes whether you're doing a capital intensive process yeah. or incremental deformation process or whatever without now a heavy dose of modeling and simulation of course because you have to be guiding yeah. what you're doing of and actually understand yeah. what it is you're you're, you're trying to produce right. and and and, yeah. and the issue of incremental deformation i think it's even more important for this team to think about location specific mm -hmm. um, microstructure and property designing yeah. and, and i don't think that you should run from it because if someone says well the whole thing should be one flavor mm -hmm. of property no. Uh, you should push back and say, no, I, I want to put properties where they're needed. Okay. We actually produce uh, here um, uh, discs that have dual microstructures, microstructures in one region and microstructures in another okay. region. We do that. And, and we do that in other parts as well, uh, where we tailor the local microstructures and local properties for cause, for purpose. Mm -hmm. And so the issue of, of incremental deformation that, that this team is looking at you should try to, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, capture that and try to use as much of that as you can uh, to add value effectively. You, 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 absolutely. So, so you mentioned modeling too. I mean, there, there's the you know the kind of old school explicit you know run run uh, finite element analysis over the whole thing with high resolution. Or I think there's also a lot of ways we can you know cut uh, cut the time out of that by using you know artificial intelligent methods where we can start. Um, I, 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 so there, there's, those are two ways. One's a numerical yeah. way, very, very, very uh, computationally cost effective. I mean, cost uh, expensive. Expensive. Right? So, yeah, if you're using finite element or uh, those kind of processes, uh, they're they're useful. But if you're trying to do uh, a very, very complicated thing and and many, many steps, like an incremental deformation process, it could take you a long time to do that. Yeah. Using using machine learning, artificial intelligence, okay, I'm okay with that too. 
to help guide. But I, I fear people are going to then use it as a crutch and think that it's going to give them every. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I personally believe that this team here has the horsepower to do things in in a, a and my, I'm going to say I'm going to say this and you're probably going to yell at me the correct way, which is actually a physics based uh, modeling approach in an analytical framework. Okay. If you can do that, you can be extremely fast. In, in, in computational speed and be appropriate relative to describing mechanisms. And if you do that, you you can actually conquer uh, a million problems and, and things that would be uh, untractable uh, by um, you know, other, other computational approaches. And I think we'd have the computational speed to actually watch the process, you know, you, you use the changes in shape to figure out what the, the strain fields yes. might be and, yep. and get the deformations out and, and then and then do some corrective actions. And actually, you know, it's uh, you know, think think like a blacksmith cyborg a little bit. Um, yep. Yeah. So get get the feedback loop going right away and build it in. Right. Right. That, that's the goal. That's absolutely the goal. Yeah. In terms of the materials you use right now, uh, because we are trying to develop a model, kind of a test case for the, you know, the, the thing that we talk about hybrid AM, you know, basically the DEV plus incremental forging. We want to build up the test case um, so that the team has a goal, say this is the end product we want to get, you know, with a certain microstructure at certain locations. Um, can you think about something for us, which is, uh, you know, interesting, challenging, and also useful? Yeah, I, I, I probably could. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that besides the material intensive side, I mean, that the tooling and equipment intensive side of, of traditional processes, mm -hmm. forging processes, there is the issue of if you do a uh, um, additive manufactured preform, mm -hmm. you're actually saving a lot of metal. Yeah. Uh, cause yeah. I didn't, I didn't talk yes, about that, yes, the, uh -huh. the billet that went in there and then had uh -huh. to go through all those like seven steps, yeah. <clears throat> each step actually has, has wastage. It does. Yeah. And so if you actually can get to effectively a final preform shape right. and then forge and, and not have that waste, that actually right. is also of value. And so yeah. a, a material you, that's very yeah. expensive. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I wouldn't actually go after, say, a plain carbon steel. Mm -hmm. You could, uh, if, if you have a very, very complicated shape that you, it, 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 its cost is so expensive to make the shape, then maybe that's, that's, the, that's the way to go. To look at a plain carbon steel example. But the cost of that material is so low mm -hmm. that it's not going to be that, that, uh, that useful from a, 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 uh, uh, reducing the, the scrap and, and uh, metal loss. If you go to something like a titanium, like, like an airframe part, like I showed, that actually is, is a fairly reasonable thing to think about. So having Boeing or Airbus uh, link in with you on an airframe part, uh, for us, it would be things such as like cases. So if we have a case that has flanges and bosses um, and we have to forge those things. Uh, it's, also, it's also titanium test explore. TIE 6-4 or 718, 718. Uh, those, uh -huh. those, kind of, those kind of materials, maybe. Uh-huh. Right. Thanks for your feedback. Do you use stainless steel at all? Um, yeah, actually, we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and actually, there are some parts... So for, for old legacy engines, there are uh, high strength steel shafts. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, uh, jet heat and, and other kinds of materials like that, they're, they're old uh, legacy uh, systems. Mm -hmm. So again, this, 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 this again may be also, you have multiple value propositions and mm -hmm. one of the value propositions could be the issue of legacy uh, hardware that is is very very hard to to uh, produce. Uh, right. The the manufacturer went out of business, or people don't want to make it anymore. The tools aren't available, so you have to figure out a way to do it effectively. So yeah. that may be something. So to think about. Uh, we we yeah. So we would 
that would be, you know, we'll be interested to learn, you know, whether you can have a stainless steel pieces that we could, first of all, the material cost is less. So it's great for all our universities to work on it. Uh, second of all, we also, you know, can have a different forms. You can think about the material is coming from plates, from powders, different ways. We can merge them together. So that's also an interesting proposition, right? Um, so if you could help us to think about a, a stainless steel part, a legacy part, that would, you know, and uh, with different kind of property needs at different locations, that would be great. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind and I'll see what I can do to, to uh -huh. try to send you some ideas or thoughts. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Great way Again, to kick off second I, year. Yeah, I appreciate you inviting me, uh, Glenn and team. And I, hopefully it wasn't uh, too master of the obvious and too boring. But I think that there's a lot of stuff out there that has been worked on and done. You guys are now going to make it uh, a reality. Oh, it was it was perfect, perfect, perfect in terms of content and, and all of that. And yeah, I mean, a lot of this has been done, but it hasn't been put together very systematically. I mean, I think we all agree with that. And, and you know, yeah. the, and that's that's what we're hoping to do. Yeah. So basically, we want to educate all these young people, you know, men and women, to be like you, what you can do, <laughs> like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, um, having a team like you guys have here now, you guys can do a, a tremendous amount. And, and I was fortunate to actually be involved with a number of those projects that I showed some historical perspective. And, and those teams were were quite high powered and and actually visionary because some of those things were were not thought about uh, and actually people have actually even forgotten about them and and those things are absolutely possible and today linking in the computer systems data management systems automated computer systems and robotic systems th they're they're almost like yeah mm -hmm. yes we can do that. You're singing our story. I, I like it. No, this is this is it. Yeah. No, this is all right. Okay. Thank you guys very, very much. Thanks, Dave. Really Thank appreciate it. So much. It was great to be a participant in Hammer Time. Thank you. <laughs> you, you do you do you do need the music here though. Yeah, but I'm sure you're wearing the right pants for it. You got the parachute pants on, don't you? There you're... you go. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Dave. Bye, all.